So, because I don't know many of you, I was thinking I, in the first slides, I will just basically say what I, I usually do very quickly and briefly. And then uh, the second part of the talk will be possibly the one which is more, more interesting from a broader point of view. Um, okay, so, well, I, I basically study biodiversity and uh, I do things like investigating species distributions, uh, the relationship between community structure and ecosystem functioning. And uh, my typical system is soil communities, soil food webs, but also the interactions between above ground and below ground community, especially plant and soil. Um, and um, especially one particular topic that uh, I will develop today is the relationship between community structure and functions, especially fluxes of energy and matter. And, um, and what happens when ecosystems are perturbed. And so, um, I will give initially examples from the soil food webs, and, but what I'm saying is generally applicable to any kind of food web and uh, network actually, network in general. Um, so the first thing to say is that food webs have very complex network structures. This is very um, true for soil food webs because they are particularly species rich and they consist of a very broad range of different types of uh, interactions. Now you can see on the top here on a, a simple diagrammatic um, example of what a soil food web look like, may look like in general. But actually if you take every single of those uh, trophic species, they actually consist of very many different species. And uh, even, if, even, even though very often those trophic species are supposed to be one particular trophic level, in fact, within those trophic species, you have a range of trophic behaviors. Um, and so actually what the real food web looks like is something like this. So they are very complex networks and they are totally comparable to networks like the internet or financial networks or networks of genes that interact with each other. So now the, the structure of this network is particularly important and it is important in terms of the energetics of the system, in terms of how the energy flows through the systems. And so also then things like the total, for example, the total amount of carbon that is uh, flowing through the system. And um, this is again a particular example from the soil food web. And you can see from this example how body mass, so the size of the organism is particularly crucial to, that, to those important quantities so quantities such as the total amount of energy that flows through the system. So for example, if you pick up a very particular group in the soil, the soil mites, a single individual of those mites is very, very light, a very small fraction of a milligram, but the population size of these species are very, very high. So for example, in European grassland, a square meter, you may have up to 20,000 individuals of just the mites. And of course, if you then take into consideration the biomass of fungi, bacteria, or the lambolans, all the organisms in the food web, it's huge densities, huge density. So if you just do the math and you transform that body mass uh, in terms of the total population size and in terms of the amount of energy that you need to support the population and you convert that into carbon, you very quickly end up into very big uh, amounts of carbon. And you can do the same for nitrogen and other key elements. And so it is the, the relationship between the body size and the configuration of the network that determine those fluxes. So you can easily see how can, you can quickly move from the structure of the community in terms of the relative abundance and biomasses of the species to how the system works in, term, or in terms of fluxes. So you have different species of different size, you can size them all. And then you have a particular distribution in the sizes of different species. And then you can use things like metabolic scaling to transform those body masses and size distribution in terms of energy consumed by the populations. And then you can basically transform your size description of the community into a metabolic rate description. So you can move very easily actually from population size and population body masses to energy fluxes. 
And these things we can do very easily nowadays. So everyone can nowadays work very easily with this type of font. It's any system, marine systems, freshwater systems, and source systems more recently. An example of why this may be important, I've been involved in the NERC source security programs in the, in the last years. This has been a major uh, funding program uh, in the UK, funded by NERC, where a number of projects example where of in, in, from an experiment where I was involved where you have controlled grassland plots and you have perturbed grassland plot in this case drought so the perturbation in this case a severe drought that we artificially impose to the system causes changes in community structures and this will change the site distribution of the species and this for the things I said before, will change the energy fluxes in the community. So the changes in the communities translate to changes in body sizes, and this will translate in changes in energy fluxes. And these things we can calculate very easily. I mean, it takes a lot of time to do the experiments very easily from a conceptual point of view. The actual amount of work you have to put into it, it's pretty substantial because you have to ideal the things, you have to weigh them. So, but in terms of the, 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 the mathematical tools and the statistics, that's pretty straightforward. So an example of how this works in, in our systems in the soil, it is now well established that you have two main energy channels. So you can basically conceptualize the whole circuit web into two main energy channels. This is a bit debated, but it's pretty much acknowledged now. And you have a bacterial one and the fungal one. This is particularly true in grassland systems. And uh, basically perturbations tend to shift the system towards uh, the bacterial channel where the energy is flowing more, more quickly and uh, which is giving some resilience to the system, but at the same time, it's making the system very, very prone to change. So it's not very resistant, but more resilient. And on the other hand, in more conservative systems or less intensively managed systems, the fungal channel is more dominant, which means the energy is flowing a bit more slowly, which means the system is more resistant to perturbation, but if it gets perturbed, it takes much longer for the system to recover. And we now have very good understanding of how environmental gradients and perturbation affects this relationship. So I just want to show you this result from our project where we had 180 plots uh, uh, as control and 180 plots as, uh, as drought across the, uh, the span of uh, Britain. And um, so we have very high replication of single individual food webs. And we could establish the relationships between the energy fluxes in the food web, net ecosystem exchange, uh, the total biomass of the food web and uh, its variation over time and relate that to general property of the food web. For example, the asymmetry in energy fluxes between fungi and bacteria, but also environmental gradients, which were mostly due to the way the land was managed and latitude, which is a key driver of um, species metabolisms. So we came up with a number of relationships and I will now show you what the relationships look like in the control food web. Um, and you can see here that solid black line are positive correlations. And when you have the dashed line, it's a negative correlation. And so and when you have the step of lines that I'm just plotting now, those are non-significant correlations. And you can see that in the control, you have very strong compensatory dynamics between the energy fluxes and the net ecosystem will change, that makes sense. The less the energy flowing through the soil food web, the less respiration. And so this will have a positive effect on net ecosystem exchange. But what is very interesting is that when you move to the drought, those relationships disappear. So this is what's happening in the control, and this is what's happening in the drought. So you can see that the point I want to make here is that we can easily measure general metrics, for example, total energy fluxes or the biomass of the communities and now that translate in terms of energy fluxes and, and, and uh, respiration, for example, in the community. We can easily measure those things and manipulate them in the field. And up to here, 
I think we are in a very good situation where we are now starting to understand how these things work in soil, which historically it's been particularly difficult to uh, investigate from the point of view of the relationship between community structure and energy flux in marine systems and in freshwater systems, the, the state of the art is a bit more advanced because there's, there's a longer tradition of studies of food webs. But basically at this moment in, in time, I would say that in terms of community ecology and relationship between community structure and energy fluxes, we are at a good point. What is missing, and now I'm now going into the second part of the talk, which, which is I think of, the broader, of a broader interest. What is really missing is our actual understanding of how the network is assembled. Because in very many cases, when we do those calculations, we assume that the network has a particular configuration. So we have a particular species and we assume, very often we have to assume, that that species is eating a number of things. So we take the natural history of the species and we just assume that the real species we are measuring in the field is following that natural history. So the topology, the, which species is connected to which species is assumed, it's given. And, um, and that's a problem because actually we know for, 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 from networks like pollen, plant pollinators networks, for example, that in fact, which species is connected to which other species changes all the time. And this may change as well in response to perturbation. So one particular important thing that we need to investigate is how the reconfiguration of the network connect to broad properties such as energy fluxes or the fluxes of uh, nutrients. And the problem is that it's not easy to observe the actual connection, the actual interactions, to observe and to determine which species is really interacting with, with other species. But that's very important because we need to ask, in order to really understand how communities and ecosystems are responding to perturbations, we need to understand, first of all, if the networks are wire, so if species changes their connections in, in response to the perturbation, this is critical to measure stability. And we also need to separate noise and st stochastic noise from the natural variation that we observe in the system. And part of this natural variation is exactly the, the variation in the connections and the intensity of those connections. Uh, another problem we have is that much of the information that we have is spatial information. But in order to really understand how a system rewires and the stability of the system over time, we need to measure the system over time. And of course, having time series for things like food webs and ecosystem, it's not easy. And it's a long process that sometimes it just lack the velocity of response that we need when we have to respond to origin calls or uh, to formulate you know, my, uh, plans to manage ecosystems in a, in, in, in a timely way. But even more, for, and, and the, the example you can see here is an example of an experimental design that you would need to have if you wanted to test whether your ecosystem is uh, falling into an alternative stable state in response to a perturbation. And without going into the details, you could see that you would need at least nine factorial combinations to answer that question. And the case where you consider a situation where you have two perturbations of the same nature, but a different size. So you may, have a, uh, you may have a drought, this can be a, a small or a larger, so a severe drought or a less severe drought, and you can have them one and then a second time. And then you ask whether the system is recovering or whether the system is settling into an alternative stable state. And to really, to really assess that, you will need at least this nine combinations. So that's re really complicated. But even more fundamental, I would say that we are missing even the right state variable to measure. How do we measure single property of the networks in a way that they really represent the overall behavior of the network? Do we measure just, do we, do we just focus on one particular species or we focus on one particular network metric and how do we measure that? Okay, so in the next slides, I will, I will try to, to answer at least partially to those questions, which is what I'm trying to do currently. So, this is where the statistical physics approach comes into place. Uh, in the last 20 years, there has been, there's been a, an exponential, exponential boom of studies investigating the structure of networks. Um, and um, physicists have been particularly active in this field. 
uh, to the point that now there are physicists just specialize on, on the study of networks. And, uh, and the concepts that we are trying to bring in into um, the description of ecological network is that of ensemble of networks. So classically in ecology, we tend to see, we, we tend to think that there is one particular network configuration, which is the real network configuration. So if I have to show you what the soil food web look like, I would show you one particular configuration that would tell you, okay, this group is eating this other group, and this is the general topology, the general shape of the soil food web network. However, in a statistical physics approach, you look at one particular network that you, that you observe in a particular point in time as only one particular state of an ensemble of possible network states. So that means that you are acknowledging the variation that you have over time and space in the real network. So you don't have one network, you have an ensemble of possible network states and what you observe is a realization from that ensemble. So then the question becomes how you can reconstruct the ensemble given the information you have from the real network. Now this idea, which is an idea that nowadays has become particularly central in the description of any kind of general network, for example, financial networks or social networks, it's no new ecology either, because in fact, for example, I was just looking into, into uh, the plant pollinator uh, literature, which, is, which has been particularly active in the field. And you know, this concept is very similar to the concept of rewiring which is a concept that for ecology is a bit more uh, usual than the concept of an ensemble of networks. It's the simple idea that over time, the interaction between uh, the, the, the species and the network changes naturally. So in plant pollinators, that's very obvious because over the seasons, different plants flowers at different times and the pollinators will interact with different type of plants. So it's just the idea of measuring this turnover in interactions. So there is a range of mathematical tools that you can, uh, statistical tools that you can use to reconstruct the ensemble of networks. And uh, here I will basically refer to these methods developed by these colleagues of mine um, um, in, in Italy and in the Netherlands. And it's basically the group of Diego Garraschelli, uh, who is a network scientist uh, I'm collaborating with. And they have developed this maximum entropy approach to, to the solution of how we can reconstruct the ensemble of networks starting from what we know of the real network. So things we know about the real network are things like how many species in the networks. And another thing that very often we know about the network is on average, given a species, how many interactions that species has. This is partial information, but it's very important information. For example, when these people analyze financial networks or social networks for issue of confidentiality, very often they don't know who is interaction with whom. So very often you cannot know which bank is interacting with, with other specific banks. The only thing you know is that bank X, for example, has got 10 partners or that person X is interaction with 100 other people, but you don't know who are those. The only thing you know is for how, for every person in the network or bank in the network, you know how many other persons they are interacting with. And the question is, can we reconstruct an ensemble of network by just using the simple bits of information? And apparently the answer is yes. So you have the original graph, the original network, you use some criteria, and in particular, these people use Shannon entropy, maximum ingestion, and you have the constraints, which in this case is how many other species are interacting with the focal species. And from that, you reconstruct the ensemble of network. Clearly, I'm not going to dig into how you do that, but it's possible. So, and uh, the references are there, it's totally possible to do that. And then the question is whether those reconstructions work. So just as an example, I pick up some data available online and I just bump into this very nice paper that's been just published, I think due to the pandemics really, uh, just published in Journal of Animal Ecology and it's a nice analysis of a plant pollinator network 
but the data were available already kind of six months ago. Um, and you can see that this plan for an network is particularly nice because these people have been sampling it for six years. And then each year they have three subseasons. So you can see from the figure how, you know, the network is changing over time. And, and then this is a bipartite network. So when you have plant and pollinators, the way you represent the network is that you put one set on the rows and one set on the other. In this case, I think it's the pollinators in the columns and the plants in the rows. And you can see from the colors, there will be the interaction shown. So what I've done, I've taken the data of this paper that are freely available because they are in Dryad. I have just worked with the binary data. So just with the one zero information about which species is connected to which other species. And I've reanalyzed their data using the maximum entropy method. So how does this work again? So you have the real network and you describe these using a binary matrix. You can see here, columns and rows are the species. And if it is black, that's an interaction there. And then I've looked at what's called the degree sequence. So for every species, we know how many other species this species in, is interacting with. And then I use maximum entropy and they can construct a number of networks that are compatible with that topology. And you can see that these gray things here, they are the networks I could reconstruct. And already superficially, they look pretty similar to the, the network, the real network. So you can see that with a very minimal set of assumptions, I can actually reconstruct the network, even if I don't know which species is interacting with which, which other species. I can just reconstruct the general structure of the network. And then what I have to do is, I have to calculate metrics on the networks, a single metric to describe a particular property of the network. And then I can do the same on the new model. And you can see that I have now all I need to compare the real network with the ensemble. Example of network metrics are, for example, in plant pollinators network, extinction slope is a very important metric. It's basically a description of uh, the network in terms of how many species you lose as you remove species from the system. So I can take, for example, one pollinator and re remove it. And I can start removing pollinators. So at some point, there will be some plants that will be left without pollinators. And that, at that point, that plant is going extinct. And so I can do this and I get the slope and this is my metric. Another very famous net network metric is nestedness. This is the concept, you can see that here, this is a perfectly nested matrix on the right. I don't know if you can see my phone here. Here, this is the perfectly nested matrix. This is the idea where, for example, if plant I interact with pollinator X, Z and Y, uh, then plant B, interact only with Z and Y and plan C only with Y. So there is a next set of interaction in the system. And there are many more metrics. There are really many, many metrics. So what I've done was to calculate a bunch of these metrics for the real network and my ensemble. And so I now have a null distribution. And what I can observe is that the real network can have value larger than the null distribution or can have a real value that fall in the distribution, which means I could reconstruct the network pretty well in that case. Or you can have a real value which is smaller than the observed, than the null distribution. And I can quantify these differences with a zeta score. So I have the observed metric and they have the average value for the null model. So this is the difference between the observed metric and the central tendency of my reconstructed network then I can use the standard deviation of the reconstructed networks to standardize that. So I can literally quantify that how the real one diverge from my ensemble. And I've done this for a bunch of metrics. And so this is what we got. So for example, this is link density, which is the density of linkage for every particular species. And you can see that uh, the blue line is the real network and they can, and my ensemble can perfectly replicate that particular property and the extinction slope as well, and the mean node degree as well. So for many metrics, the ensemble of network I could construct is a very good representation of the observed network. And in fact, describe all possible variation in the real network. For other metrics like nested nets, you can see that the zeta score is quite away from the null distribution, which means there is a significant difference between 
the real network and remove the submission. Okay, so I have now a method to reconstruct networks even when I have very partial information on the network. And why is that useful? Okay, so the reason why this may be useful is that I can pick up a metric or a number of metrics, but let's just focus on one, and I can now track that over time, or I can compare that between impact and control. So this is simulation, and you can see that I have the zeta, the zeta, the zeta, the zeta score on the y-axis for a particular metric. And so that zeta score is telling me the, the divergence of the real network from the ensemble. And so this is the normal network over time, and it's all okay, and then the crisis comes. But at some point, there's a change in regime. So I can now monitor the change in regime over time for the network. Or more simply, I could have an experiment where I have my control, the normal network, and then because of the perturbation, the network goes down. So I can now do this. This was my problem. Now I have a, a tool to monitor the network over time. And then if there's a change in regime, I can check that because I have a powerful measure to control for network structure, even when I have partial information. And then if there's a big crisis, I can see that. Now for ecological system, that's not been done at the moment experimentally. So I can show the principle only theoretical, but that this is, can be important as demonstrated by the application that the people who invented the method have done for this method to financial systems. What you see here is a number of property of the Dutch, uh, of the quarterly interbank exposure among Dutch banks. Uh, if you look into this motif, just to explain that, you see that the doubts are the banks and the other is the, the flux of money basically flowing through the banks. This is a particular motif in the network, okay. And you can see that basically this is from 1998 to 2008. 2008 was the financial crisis year. And you can see that if, and the thing is we have the time series so we can reconstruct those. So you could have actually predicted the crisis in 2005 if you had used this method. So if, you know, if you monitor particular topological properties of the network using maxim, maximum entropy ensembles, you can actually have early warning signals of, you could have had early warning signals of the 2008 financial crisis already in 2005. And so if we, if we transfer the concept, we could do the same with ecosystems. We could do experiments and we could see what are the topological properties of the networks that we need to follow in order to possibly detect an early warning signal of a systemic crisis. The tool is there. Okay, so, Last five minutes to, to speak about a related topic. Um, very often in, in, when we work with this type of networks, we measure particular quantities. For example, in the case of species, we measure the density of particular species. Uh, consider, for example, a grassland where you have the biomass of the plants in the grasslands, different species. And then if you sum the biomass of different species, you have the total biomass of the grassland. And so you have the total productivity of the grassland, which is a very key property, for example, in agroecosystems. And you can see here that you have species fluctuating over time. And you can see that when the species tend to co-vary in a positive way over time, the sum of them is pretty variable. But when the species tend to, when, when one goes going up and then going down, so they are, they are anti-correlated, the variation of the sum of the species it's less. So the system is more stable. So, and there is of course lots of randomness in this, in the sense that this species do not fluctuate in a regular way, especially in a nice way as I have simulated here. There is stochastic variation in the species. And so one thing we want to know is what are groups of species that changes over time in the similar manner and how can we separate that from random fluctuations? That are due to things that we cannot measure. And uh, again, one of the answer is coming from network. And I will show you the basic concept and then, and you can see that here, I, I, you have a simulation of three different sets. 
of variables. So every color can be seen, can be considered to be a species. We have one, two, and three. And if you do the correlation matrix over time of the species, you have three groups. Very simple. So the question is, can we use real data and detect those groups? Because if we can do that, we can measure an important stability property of the system. And the answer is that we can. It is a bit tricky, but we can. We can definitely do that. And it comes down to analyze the correlation matrix of species. So if you have a multivariate time series, and you have very many things you have measured over time, and this could be at any time scale, for example, for um, Genes, it could be measuring gene expressions over a period of time. And then you have very many genes you're measuring, and they've been measuring them will be, I don't know, 50 times over time. And then you have the correlation matrix of the temporal covariation between the genes. So this is very broad. And basically, random matrix theory tells us that you can Calculate the eigen, okay, so I'm going to be a bit technical now, but I promise that by the end of this technical, like it's about a minute of words like eigenvalues and eigenvectors, some people may not like that, but uh, the, the, the final application is pretty practical. Everyone must have, especially if you're an ecologist, you have, you have run a principal component analysis of some community matrix at some point. And even if you're not an ecologist, I'm pretty sure that many of you have calculated principal component analysis of correlation matrices. So uh, even if you don't like eigenvalues, you must have heard of them. And the correlation matrix can be very easily decomposed into eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And if you do this for the particular correlation matrix I'm looking at here, you get that the violet is the distribution of the eigenvalue of the matrix. And then if you have a new model of that, you have distribution of the random component of the matrix. And basically the key concept is that we can estimate the random component of the matrix and we can describe the real matrix, what you observe as the sum of the random component plus the signal. And so the real matrix can be decomposed into signal and randomness and with this particular tool, you can extract the random component. So you can filter the random noise. And then you can uh, apply a concept, which is a concept of modularity, which is the concept, a network concept, where modul modularity is a concept where in a module you have species that interact more with each other than between each other. So you have the matrix, you have the modularity matrix, you are now have the random component, and now you have the signal. And so you can ID those particular clusters, and you can also have a metric of volatility, which will tell you how variable the old system is in terms of the overall structure of the community. So I have done this for uh, a global data set, the BioTime database, which is a big database of time series of multiple communities. And you can see that those quantities are relatively easy to calculate, and this has been done for marine fish, birds, mammals, and vertebrates and plants. And you can see that there are big patterns and clear patterns in those metrics. And volatility especially seems to be a very important metric to separate the different taxa. And uh, you can see that volatility, it's very highly correlated to species richness. So this is early ages for this type of techniques. But the idea is that by using again a concept from networks, you can actually decompose time series of networks into quantities that are directly related to stability. So just to conclude, I would say that, especially the technique of ensemble, in the reconstruction of ensemble of networks is very promising because it's giving us very practical tools to monitor variation in the network, even when we don't have complete information on the networks. And these methods are very broadly applicable to any type of networks and multivariate time series. So if you have social networks or if you have networks of uh, any other nature, these methods are there to be applied. Um, okay, so I'll leave it there. Uh, just want to thank especially Diego Garlaschelli, who has been very important for, for, 
to teach me basically how to apply some of those methods. And then for the data I've shown about soil food webs, uh, Richard Budget, Jocelyn and Mathilde, um, Jocelyn Lavalle and Mathilde Chumel, who gave me lots of the figures uh, and data that I've shown today. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's me. <laughs>